we've been moving our way through the uh, book of Acts. Um, the first 13 Sundays of this year, as we have walked through this, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know that I've done a very good job. Um, the Lord and I have really uh, sought to, to, I've been seeking to listen and to hear what all that God would have us to know. And uh, the Lord has been working in my life. I set aside 10 weeks uh, this year that will conclude um, this coming Sunday on Resurrection Sunday where uh, I wanted to, to listen, I wanted to believe, I wanted to trust, I wanted to hear, I wanted to know that which would be fresh. I wanted to be the pastor that I needed to be, the husband that I needed to be, the friend that I needed to be, the father that I needed to be, the, 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 the witness that I needed to be. Um, the leader that I needed to be. And uh, it's when you come to this place, the Lord has brought each and every one of these um, uniquely. And I've, I've asked myself probably every week, why, Lord, why this particular message? And uh, today, the Lord has uh, really been bearing some things heavily upon my heart, showing me some things that I really haven't ever seen before. And I, I want to bring it to your attention. In Acts chapter 9, I'm going to take two verses that we kind of talked about last week when, when Saul was on the road to Damascus and the Lord met him there. Jesus Christ in the Shekinah glory of God met him there and it knocked Saul to, his, to the ground. He was blinded by the light, but he saw our resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they had a, the best way I can say it is they had a come to Jesus meeting right there on the Damascus road. And he told Saul to get up and to go into Damascus and someone would come, and come to see him. And as Saul was there in Damascus, he, he received a vision that someone named Ananias would come to him and lay hands upon him. He would regain his sight, but he would know what to do. And, and that's exactly what happened. But, but God, Jesus Christ actually met with Ananias too to, to talk with him and, and to to share with him that that's what he wanted him to do, is to go and speak to Saul. And Ananias had heard of Saul, and heard that Saul was the, the one that had been given permission to go and find Christians and take them and jail them, to threaten them, to possibly hurt them, possibly to even take their life. So obviously Ananias was a little reluctant to do this. But in his fellowship of Christ, he never let fear keep him from obedience. So Jesus described to him why Saul. Why Saul? In verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, before kings, before the children of Israel. For I will show him, I will show Saul, how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, this is all your word. You've put it together collectively for us in the beautiful way that you have. It is the, it is the God-breathed, inspired word. You have called the preaching of the word so that we could hear it. Lord, I pray that I will be obedient to that today. But Lord, May it not be just the surroundings or the, the, the way in which the sermon is shared. But Lord, we pray that Christ, you will anoint your holy word with the anointing to our hearts, our minds, our thoughts to where we can feel the, the working of the Holy Spirit, the drawing of the Holy Spirit, the desire of God's best for us. So Lord, we could worship You. We could not just have a Bible study, but Lord, we could be moved to Your presence in obedience. So challenge us with this very strong challenge that You've placed before us. And I pray, Lord, that it would find the place of obedience in our life for Your glory and Lord, for our benefit, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Why Saul? That's the question. Why the apostle to the Gentiles? Why did God choose 
him. But the question is, why would God choose any of us? Why Judas Iscariot? When Jesus called him, he knew that he would betray him. Why call him? And yet, Jesus treated him the way that everyone should be treated. The Bible tells us that, that you are to do unto others as you would have that person to do unto you, that you would love others the way you want to be loved. You would bless others the way you would want to be blessed. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus treated him in the best way that he knew how, even though he knew he would betray him. What about Peter? Why Peter? That impulsive, rough, bold servant. Yet he was a, a person of great introspection and faith who finished well. He preached at Pentecost, was anointed in an amazing way where so many came to know the Lord. Why Matthew? Why choose a tax collector? Matthew, who was so very Jewish, who knew the ways of Judaism, but yet he was also bought into society. He bought into being a tax collector. You could literally look at Matthew and say he had everything that Judaism could bring him, but he also wanted to have everything that the world could bring him. Maybe that was why God called Matthew and God intimately gave his word to him so that he could bring the first Gospel to us, the very personal things that God shared. Why Judas, not Iscariot? You know, there were two disciples named Judas. One was Judas Iscariot, we all know, was the one who betrayed our Lord and Savior. But, but why not? Why, why Judas? We know so little about him. Judas, not Iscariot. And yet, listen to me, he was important. He had a role to play. And he was loved by God and used by God. Why Saul? That's our original question. And I want to share from these words that Jesus gave Ananias and maybe to understand a little better why Saul or why me or why you. Why would God choose us? Look at these words again. In verse 15, Jesus told Ananias, go, go to him, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. A chosen vessel. Chosen eklage in Greek. It's seven times in the New Testament. This word that, we, that is translated chosen means the act of picking out of choosing. It is literally the act where God chose before the foundation of the world to decree his blessings through Christ to us in amazing grace. Let me say that again. It is the act where God, before the foundation of the world, decreed his blessings through Christ to us with His amazing grace. This is the only place where it is translated chosen. The other six times it is, it is translated elect. Being the elect. So, and by the way, that is a very biblical world, word. Election is all through the New Testament. We are God's elect. But that doesn't mean that we're God's favorites where someone else is left out. It means that we are God's favorites because He blessed us. He wants to bless us. You have what you have because God wanted you to have it. He knows the plans that He has for you. Plans for good for you. Not evil. Because God has plans in all of our lives for a future, and for hope. Are you listening? God wants to bless you in an amazing, divine, loving, kind. Only what He can give, that's what He wants to do for all of you. 
But 35 years ago, really 38 years ago, when I surrendered to the ministry, I understood that there was a verse in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, that says, Unto whomsoever much is given, much will be required. Literally what he is saying, if I give you little, I'm not going to require as much. But if I give you more, then I'm, I'm going to expect you to use that. It, it parallels with that, that parable uh, uh, of the talents. If God gives degrees of blessing, there's a, also an expectation that you use it. So unto you that much is be given, much will be required. Much will be required. Everyone has a special blessing, a possibility that has been given by God, and we must accept it by grace through faith, and we must accept it as God's best for us. We are chosen by the King of kings, the God of all eternity, and that that He has blessed us with, we must rejoice in and use it for His sake. We are elect for that. But he also says, not only as a chosen vessel of mine, but also to bear my name, to bear who I am, what I do, to bear my name before the Gentiles. Oh, they cared about the Jews. Saul was, I mean, he was a, he was a Pharisee. He was a zealot. He, he, he was Jewish from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He loved the Old Testament Scriptures. He knew the Old Testament Scriptures. He knew all the promises of the Old Testament Scriptures. He yielded himself. It was everything that he wanted to do. But yet God says, the chosen thing that I have for you is not to go to those that you love, but to go to those that I love. The Gentiles. And uniquely, that's exactly what Saul was, a missionary to the Gentiles. In his ministry, he would go. And he would, he would go walk by boat or wherever. It did not matter. He went to city, to the next city, to the next city, to the next city. Three missionary journeys. His life was to go to make sure that everywhere in the Gentile word, world, they had the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And God used him, anointed by the Holy Spirit, to give us half of the New Testament. And I am grateful. Bear my name to the Gentiles. Bear my name before kings. To Aretas. Before Festus. Before King Agrippa. And finally to Caesar himself. He stood in the presence of the leaders, the very, the very king, the ruler, and shared about the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When Saul shared before Agrippa, Agrippa said these words, Almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. Saul said, I wish it was not just almost, but altogether. As they saw, they, they heard the words of Saul, but they saw his life and they saw his passion. And, and literally, they felt the anointing of God, the way that you and I feel the anointing of God when God comes close and draws us near. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name to the Gentiles, to the kings, but also to the children of Israel. Look what it says here. In Acts 9, in verse number 20, immediately he preached Christ, the Christ in the synagogues. That's where the Jews met. <laughs> I wonder how many times Saul had been to the synagogue in his life. Every Saturday, he was there. It was, it was take the, 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 the day of the Lord, the Sabbath day, and keep it holy unto the Lord. He would be there to worship, but now that he has Christ, he still did that. But now he's preaching Christ that he is the Son of God. But notice back in verse 16, a phrase that I've heard so many times. 
I, I cannot tell you how many times I've read the New Testament. I cannot tell you how many times I've read the book of Acts. I cannot tell you how many times I've studied the life of what, the one that we would call Paul. And I, I understood this verse. It was familiar to me. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. But yet, until this week, when the Holy Spirit just really bore it down within me as I've been studying it for, for really for a long time this year, but this week, the spotlight of the anointing of God just kept pushing down on my heart and pushing down on my heart. And I said, Lord, people don't want to hear that. People don't want to hear what you're trying to say. But I understood that I was called not to be popular, but to be faithful. And not to get your vote, but his vote. And not to cherry pick the parts of scripture that I wanted to preach, but to bring the whole countenance of the word of God before you. I will show him what he must suffer for my name's sake. That's a ministry not many of us want to sign up for. We have no, look at this, look at this, that bring the peace lilies that are before us. None of us have a full knowledge or acknowledgement of all that Christ willingly gave and suffered and went through to bear the price of salvation, what he left behind how he lived, how this was his full duty and the joy, how he went through one difficulty and one relationship, how difficult it was for him to love so completely and receive such rejection, to be spat upon, to pull out his beard, to mock him, how many times he was beaten by his stripes we are healed. The price of our, our salvation. None of us can fully know or acknowledge the price. But if you would be willing to listen today, you would understand that that was not just his path, but it's the path of wisdom. It's the path of truth. It's the path that... that, that opens the doors to the treasury in heaven where all the blessings that flow from the, the, the holy seat of God, where all of those can be functioned in, and God has desired that, that we could have those things and receive those things and yield those things and use those things for His glory and for our benefit. Jesus understood that there was no price too high to pay for our salvation. Yet too many people want all the blessings of salvation with no cost to them. Just ease, comfort, and prosperity. There is something that is shocking me. And somehow in our country in which we live, and I love our country, but for all these years, we have taken the good news of Jesus Christ as he presented it in the word of God, God's best for us. And we've tried to amalgamate it. We've tried to blend it in. We've tried to make it one with the American dream. That everyone wants to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we want the best, the best homes, the best cars, the best jobs, the best friends, the best hobbies, the best clothes, the best food. We want all of the best and we're so willing to partake of it. And, and it bothers me that so much of the gospel that I hear preached today is that if you love Jesus, if you, if you serve Jesus, then God wants that best for you. He wants the best for you. It's not just that he wants the American dream because the American dream is about us and that's where we present ourselves first, where we become the God. We become the idol that we look to. You don't want to hear that, do you? 
And if we don't like it, we reject it, we walk away from it. If somebody preaches something that we don't like, we'll just go somebody, find somebody else. If somebody hurts our feelings, we'll just resign and go away. If Jesus did that, he wouldn't have made it very long in the ministry. It bothers me that Baptists, Southern Baptists as we are, the largest denomination in the United States, continue fall as we have for 50 years. We're still the largest in America, but we are falling. And the numbers of the Christians in Uganda alone, Uganda is just about to pass us. As a matter of fact, Every mainline denomination in America is in a free fall. Churches are closing every day. And we just say, we've just got to, uh, we've got to have a better show. We've got to have a better performance. We live where people expect things to be given to them. So we need, we need a pastor. We need a church that does more and more to give to people. That's the gospel of the American dream. And the places in the world today where the gospel is growing the most is the place where persecution. He must suffer for my name's sake. He must value Christ more than he values himself in the world. A call so important. In 1942, my dad made an extremely great decision. He married my mom. He went to my mom's house to tell my grandparents that he wanted to marry her. My grandmother wanted no part of that. She told her husband, my grandfather, six foot seven, a man's man told my dad, five foot seven, 128 pounds. Why don't you just delay this? I'm not against it. Just don't do it now. My dad looked at my mom and said, what do you think? My mom said, if you're going to marry me, you're going to marry me today. <laughs> they got in the car, went to a place called Wahala, South Carolina. Can I get an Amen. And they got married and had a flat tire on the honeymoon. <laughs> but they also knew something else. The war was going on. And my dad volunteered. He enlisted. He didn't wait to be drafted. And he left my mama pregnant because he knew that it was a high likelihood that he wouldn't make it back. Yet he volunteered, yet he went, because the cause was so important. It was more important than his life. There was a greater cause to give his life to. My dad never talked about the horrors of war. Maybe with his brothers, but never with anybody else. But every time he saw the flag, a tear would come to his eye. Every time that he did a funeral where the flag would be cast over the casket, he would cry because he understood a life well lived for a greater cause. What is the value of a human soul? Christianity has always grown the most where there were places of war and it's grown the least when the people sat back and just simply enjoyed. Saul needed some time with the Lord. Galatians chapter 1 says that he left Damascus and went out into the wilderness of Arabia and he spent three years there with the scrolls, with the Old Testament scripture. Three years with the Lord as the Lord, listen to me now, as he spent the time in the word, the Lord began to burn within him that mission. And he came back. Look at scripture here. 
Immediately he preached, this is verse 20, immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is not this he who destroyed those who call on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for, for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? Saul increased all the more in strength, confounded the Jews who were dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is this Jesus is the Christ. Now, here, we're about to get to Saul's resume. This is so good. Please stay with me for the next few moments. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, put him in a basket, tied a rope, let him down through the wall, a window in the wall, in a large basket. Now, come on now, don't miss this. There were times that there were uproars, there were disturbances, there were mobs, there were riots. And Paul always wanted to get right in the middle of it. But this time they said, you can't do that. We're going to put you in a basket, tie a rope to it, and we're going to let you out a window. In the middle of the night, you're going to sneak away. Humiliated. Yet God began to teach him a lesson that I pray that God would speak to us today. If you have your Bibles, look over in um, the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians, chapter number 11. I'm going to do a no-no in preaching. I'm going to read some scripture. I can't preach it any better than the Word of God. Amen? So I, I'm just going to read some scripture to you. Most of y'all know Corinthians was a, the church that, that began in the, in the city of Corinth. Paul went to that city of 100,000 people, and, and, and he was the only Christian there. Maybe there was Ananias and Sapphira. I don't know. But, but Literally, God came in in the power of the Holy Spirit and just turned that place upside down. It was just wonderful, and, and, and people began to be saved. And, but, but they came out of a very Gentile, very Greek uh, background. And, and listen, they, they received the true gospel. But, but it was like they took it, and, and God help me, it's like they, they put it and said, oh, this is wonderful, and they folded it up and put it in an envelope and stuck it in their pocket. Literally what they tried to do is what I think has happened in America today. They want the gospel and all the benefits and, and to know God. They, they want that, but they kind of stick it in their pocket and live their life in their culture, and if they ever need it, they can pull it out and use it. But most of most of what happens in here on Sunday for an hour, or when I preach a couple hours, it, it, it gets left behind and we don't think about it. Our Bibles will go home and set it down and we won't open it up too much. And we'll go on, listen, to live our life the way we want it, how it's folded to us, and we have that Christianity that we carry with us around in our pocket. So Paul wrote the first letter to, to them, 1 Corinthians, and it was a letter of correction. You need to straighten this stuff out. But when he came back, he, by the way, he was hated by the, not hated. He was really disliked by the church at Corinth, though he was the founding. And they really said, what authority do you have? All these other people are coming in. They're preaching things that we like. Sounds like the prosperity gospel that I'm hearing all over. So, Paul began to share his resume here. Let me read some scripture. This is in chapter 11. We're going to begin reading in verse 13. When he's speaking about these other people that are preaching, he says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. 
Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into, into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to the works. Then he says in verse 22, this is who I am. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seeds of Abraham? So am I. Are they the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant. In stripes, being whipped above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times. I received 40 stripes minus one. Beaten with the cat of nine tails. Those, those nine leather straps that would have rock and wood and glass tied into them. 39 stripes. You weren't supposed to get 40 because that, that, they said that would kill you. So they were being humane by only giving you 39 stripes. This didn't just happen once. It happened five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Most likely, that's the Roman caning. Once, they threw rocks at me and knocked me down. Knocked me, they, they kept throwing rocks at me until they thought I was dead and they leave me for dead. That's what they called a stoning. Three times, I was shipwrecked. I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't have got back on that boat that second time. Three times. A night and a day I've been in the deep. All day out there in the waters. And then the nights came and all night out there in the waters. Maybe holding on to something. Maybe just trying to stay afloat. Tired, weary, muscles aching. Thinking you're going to go down. But if Jesus wouldn't let Peter go down, he's not going to let Paul either. In journeys often. In peril. The word peril can literally mean in danger. In very prevalent danger. In perils of water. Well, amen. In perils of robbers. In perils of my own countrymen, the Jews. In perils of the Gentiles. Well, I can't escape. In perils in the city. I can't escape. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, look at Jesus. In hunger and thirsting, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. I don't know that anybody in America today is going through these things. I don't know anybody, if we talked about this as the, the ways of Christ in the church, I don't know that that church would have too many people in it. The ones that I see all the hundreds and thousands going to are the ones that are preaching the ease and the air conditioning and the comfort and, and just come and we will bless you and we will enjoy and we will sing. I don't know how many people would sign up for this. Yet, this is a man learning strength. Learning power. Besides the other things that come upon me daily, my deep concern, my burning passion within me for all the churches. Who is weak? Verse 29. Don't forget that word. Don't forget that word. Let that word have the laser focus of your mind right now. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmities that have led to my weaknesses. I'm not going to boast about how many church I've started, how many, how many people I've led to Christ. How many, how I am the, the greatest church planner that's ever lived. How that God would so use me and bless me to let me write half the New Testament. Those are not the things of my resume. If you want to see 
He came to a place in time in his life that he understood the most important thing as a faithful Christian is being weak. Who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, all those years ago, the governor under Aretas the king was guarding the city of the people of Damascus with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. That's not the things that you and I would brag about, is it? So many times, church, listen to me. Oh, I want to come because we need a, I, I want to hear the pastor preach so I can learn. I, I want to go to, to, to have another Bible study. I, I, look, that will tell you a lot of facts, but, but that's not going to get you to the presence of God. You know how you're going to know Christ? It's not just to study, but to be obedient to it, no matter what. To follow Him, no matter where. To value Him. To understand His path that He laid before us. Now, we talked about weakness. Nobody wants to sign up for that. But let me tell you what happens if you do. You want to hear the good part? Chapter 12, verse 1. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was called up to the third heaven, the first heaven where our oxygen is, the second heaven going to orbit the, the, the Milky Way, the galaxies, the billions and trillions of galaxies that are out there. But someplace beyond that in the very presence of God is called the third heaven. I know a man, verse 3, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words. This finite mind has no ability to understand or to express the things that I saw and the things that I heard and the glory that was there, the joy, the peace, the love. I, I was taken in the presence of heaven. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, that's normal, it's human, I will not be a fool. For I speak the truth, but I refrain lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears me to be. Keep going now, listen. And lest I should be exalted above measure. By the abundance of the revelations. I mean, if I had had that experience, I'd have came back and written a book. I, I'd have been on all the talk shows. It'd have been a bestseller. I mean, everybody wants to know about heaven. Everybody's looking for the joys of heaven. Everybody wants to be in the presence of God. Everybody wants no pain. Everybody wants no heartache. We just can't wait to get to heaven. That's why we keep that Christianity in the envelope with us because if something happens to us, we want to pull it out and say, here's my token in. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A gift. A blessed gift a messenger of Satan to buffet me, sent by Satan to make my life miserable, hoping that as I go through it, I'll quit and give up. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. I mean, he prayed for others and God answered his prayers. Amen? But when he prayed for his own difficulty and hardship and pain, Folks, this is most likely an unbelievable physical endurance that he had to go through. 
God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, you don't need anything else. You got everything you need. Oh, I know you'd like to be like it was when you were in paradise. But the job's not done. The mission's not over. I think that's why Paul said, I run the race that is before me. He understood that every day, every breath, no matter what he went through, no matter how difficult it may be, he knew that he had to complete the task that was before him. He had to follow the ways of Christ. Therefore, most gladly, oh, no, 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 let me back up. I missed the last part. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength, God's strength, is made perfect. It is made complete. It is made mature. It is made of the most value to you in, what's that last word? Did you have the laser focus there? If our focus is to get away from obedience of anything that may bring physical pain or, or emotional pain. We want to get away from that because we don't want to be weak. We want to be strong. We want to have everything that the American Christian has. We feel like it's our right. He said, but God says, all the strength of Christ that created the world is made fully mature and complete in your life when you are. Say it again. Say it again. Let it, let it come to you. Weak. Therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am, say it again, weak, then I am. Am Christ strong. Look up here. Was he weak? I don't think there's anything, humanly speaking, that he could endure more than he endured. I don't think there's an emotional twist that he didn't feel. He was rejected by men. And yet, he loved. It was not too high of a price to pay. He loved with an amazing love. I think in his eyes, when he looked upon those through the blood that was dripping through, it was the, the heart of God loving and he died. And he was buried where the world puts a period at the end of that sentence. But up from the grave and is alive and well today and is speaking to heart here today. And he's not calling you to say, oh, I want to lift you up more in this world. I want you to have more of the blessings of this world. He is saying, I want you to follow the path of finding the least of yourself so that you can find the greatest of me. Someone has preached a different gospel and we bought it. Someone has preached that we can do this easy believism. And we've got a, a, a nice little envelope in our pocket that we can just live our life the way that we want to. We don't have to follow his way. We don't have to follow his path. We'll do what we want when we want. And one day, because uh, God is good to us and God's made a covenant with us, we're going to go to heaven. His covenant was he gave all. But I remember praying those words, all my life I give to you. It's not a popular message, is it? I will guarantee you it, it wasn't popular in my soul because I said, nobody's going to want to hear this. But you know what the Holy Spirit told me? Preach Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. 
and he is the life. People will either receive Jesus as he is or they will reject Jesus as he is. They will receive his path. There was a man that came to Jesus who had the wealth of this world. He was a religious man. We know him as the rich young ruler. He said, Lord, what do I need to do? Jesus says, you know the commandments, follow them. All those things I have done from my youth. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way. Sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. Get rid of all the idols. If money's the idol, get rid of it. Whatever it is that you think that is your security, go your way, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and take up your cross and follow me. There is a path that God has taught us to follow. Will you follow it or not?